Well, good afternoon, friends. Mark Holmes here, and as always, I want to thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. I'm taking a break from the workshop. Actually, the machine's out there cutting stuff, and it's a little noisy in there, so I didn't want to uh, do the video on top of that stuff, and I got to run to Home Depot. Some good news. If you are a DYI person, a general contractor, or um, you know anybody in the trade, uh, with the stock lumber futures crashing literally cutting in half in the last two months the price of lumber is actually beginning to go down and now two by fours are actually under six dollars a piece i know that still sounds like a lot you know they should be about 2.99 but they are following and there's beginning a price war so i know you don't care about that but check out my other channel joe boo's day job because we do price checks and stuff and ways to save you money on your buildings and things now speaking of saving money we know we've got steven Catboy Jones, who is a penny pincher. Um, today's going to be a quieter day for our Dallas Cowboys than, of course, yesterday. Yesterday was great because we got a taste of the team on the field, you know, getting some, you know, where, where everybody's lining up, who's getting the early nod at starting and so forth. You know, we, we found out a couple of really great things out there. Um, uh, and a couple of things that have you concerned, you know, James Washington's in a walking boot because he's got tendonitis. He said, you'll be fine by the time minicamp gets here. Um, that's actually good because then Jalen Tolbert gets more time and reps and stuff to go ahead and hopefully get a bigger role for the Cowboys as well. Then, of course, we have the really the big worry is the big guy, Tyrannosaurus, Tyron Smith, of course, having back tightness. And, you know, th this is my... If I were to say things that keep me up at night um, about the Cowboys, it would be the concern of Tyron Smith because as Tyron Smith goes with this offense, the team goes. Now, the thing that's amazing to me because um, one of the things the talking heads do is they always talk about what the Cowboys lose um, and how we can't recover from those things. And sometimes, of course, when you end up losing, say, um, a great player, it's hard to replace them. But the narrative that we're getting on some of our players, like Lyle Collins, Lyle Collins, don't get me wrong, I like Lyle Collins, I've met Lyle Collins, great individual and things, but Lyle Collins is on the tail end side of his career. And as much as they're talking about the Cowboys, oh, man, they've lost so much because they lost Lyle Collins. I think it's a great move for Cincinnati because I think he's an upgrade. But let's be clear. Lyle Collins didn't play at all the year before because of the hip injury, and he missed seven games this past year. And he had nine penalties in ten games. I'm not sure that losing Lyle Collins is really the death nail that everybody proclaims. And, of course, they talk about Connor Williams. Oh, man, the Cowboys lost Connor Williams. How many times do you see Connor Williams basically lifted up and dropped off in the lap of Dak Prescott along with the 14 penalties? I look at that and say between the two guys, that's 25 uh, or 23 penalties between the two of them. And I dare say Terrence Steele is a better player. They don't tell you that, of course, what the talking is. And in the same regard... Losing Amari Cooper may not be the worst thing either because you now have CeeDee Lamb who is stepping into the spotlight. You know, this is the opportunity for CeeDee Lamb who we took in the first round. Remember that. We didn't draft CeeDee Lamb to be a guy to sit on the bench to be second fiddle. You spent a number one draft pick as early as we did on a receiver when you had needs on the defense, you need that guy to be able to step up and be the guy. And apparently, he's growing into the position because he's put on 10 pounds of muscle, and he's also grown a half an inch. You're going to see a guy who's been working out hard to get stronger, faster to to learn the intricacies and now truly has the spotlight and i think he's going to shine but not only that i think you're going to see a more dynamic offense and see this is where we've got dalton schultz who currently is on the franchise tag and his comments about the franchise tag sound like what dak prescott said
I let my agent handle all that kind of uh, business. Right now, I'm focused on the OTAs. So he's scheduled to get ten point nine million dollars, and you know, for this year. And the team, of course, has said uh, they want to get a long term deal done, which may or may not be true. Maybe just lip service. But in my mind, I think the Cowboys could be comfortable doing the franchise tag for him because it's only ten point nine million dollars. This isn't quarterback franchise tag or wide receiver franchise tag where we're talking about like, you know, the $30 million range for a quarterback or, you know, the mid-20s for a wide receiver. 10.9 is not that bad for the tight end and will give you the option of saying, hmm, Jake Ferguson, could he step into that role next year and be the guy? But more importantly, is it one of those things where we look at the offense and it evolves to where New England was several years ago? I remember how dynamic New England's offense was with Gronk as a young man before the back issues and Aaron Hernandez. Now, it was before Aaron Hernandez you know, went totally gangster and stuff on there. But to me, in my mind, a tight end, especially now at the price of wide receivers, has become more important. You can look at the recent history of almost every Super Bowl team that's out there in you know the last 10 years. All of them have had an outstanding top 10 tight end. The security blanket, the guy that gives you flexibility, the guy that can help you know be a blocker as well, a guy who's a mismatch with linebackers and cornerbacks, that those guys are really and truly important. And this is where, you know, looking at a guy like Jake Ferguson who can block but also might not be a bad receiver who can get into the NFL and then all of a sudden be able to take another step because most tight ends, believe it or not, most great ones aren't first-round draft picks. It's very rarely that tight ends are drafted in the first round. And when you have a quarterback like Dak Prescott who is actually good on the move, who can, you know, when the play breaks down, needs that security blanket, Jake Ferguson could be that guy. And again, I've been predicting that the Cowboys will go more 12 personnel this year than they have in past because that's one of the things that have really worked. And as crazy as it sounds that a running formation, basically a 12 personnel, typically is a heavy package running formation, the Cowboys actually have the players out there to make this to be one of those ones where it's literally not just a running formation, that it could end up being a five wide out formation. And not too many teams have that capability. And having lost Amari Cooper, it be beho- especially also too, having to wait on when Michael Gallup is going to be ready, it behooves you to actually use this more. And you could actually look at a point of saying that mm, maybe Amari Cooper won't be as important in this offense as he would be if we were doing more three wide out sets. Now, don't get me wrong. Mari Cooper can be a great player, but in the same way I talk about Lyle Collins, who had nine penalties in 10 games, who missed uh, 16, 23 games over the last two seasons, it may be overblown the loss of him than it is having him. Now, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm stupid. I don't know. Uh, You can... Look at however you want to. But I think that we're looking at a a sea change on the Cowboys offense where I think about here's here's where it's kind of crazy. And actually, I should have already pulled this up. But let me pull it up, because what you have to understand is balance is the key to end of your woes. And what I think about is 2016 that offense there weren't superstars um on that team the offensive line played well and you had basically the ball going everywhere okay Dak Prescott only had 23 touchdowns 3600 yards passing uh 67 percent completion percentage um only four interceptions and this is key when you're balanced, when a team doesn't know what you're going to do. I want you to listen to where these numbers went. Now, of course, Zeke Elliott had 1,600 yards, which was great, but um, you know, you're not going to get that again. 
um, I don't think ever again from 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 him. But here's where the numbers actually are pretty kind of crazy. When we think about our wide receiver core, okay, Cole Beasley, 833 yards, okay, Jason Witten, 673 yards, Des Bryant, 759 yards, Terrence Williams, 594 yards, Bryce Butler, 219 yards. You didn't have a lot of guys that were making tons and tons of yardage. You didn't have, you know, the, the Tariq Hill that's leading the team or the Devontae Adams. What you had is you had a cluster of guys that are all getting numbers that are somewhat in the same ballpark, okay? Your tight end, 693 yards. You know, Des Bryant, about 800 yards. Cole Beasley, about 800 yards. If you can equally distribute the football around, it makes it tougher for a defense, because they have to cover all the bases. It may be one game that Des Bryant is going off and having a great mismatch and stuff. It might be another one that a Cole Beasley goes off and has a great mismatch and stuff. And you can go through here and keep it from being where a team says, if we stop that guy, you stop the offense. And that's where you want to be dynamic. And that's where the 12 personnel and getting a guy like Jake Ferguson and also having – um. But Michael's over here shaking it. What, you shaking your head about my conversation? No. Oh, okay. I thought he was disagreeing. Or having Dalton Schultz, um, you know, able to be the guy one day. Or using Tony Pollard as a wide receiver out the backfield. Dynamic balance is how the Cowboys will be able to win. Now, before I get out of here, I've got to go through here. Now, um, a couple of days ago, I went to the proposed location for the Washington Commanders um, new stadium. And I gave you my thoughts on it and said that that's not a good location for it. Um, If you've ever had to work in Washington, D.C., and during rush hour having to go to Woodbridge, the traffic, it's only about 20 miles. Oh, yeah. Right. Once you get to, because when you get to the Occoquan River Bridge to that exit, it's, it's always jacked up. There's only Interstate 95, which is the heaviest corridor of traffic on the East Coast, that's right there. That's already a bottleneck. There's no metro there. And this is like way out in the su- – I mean, this is way out in the suburbs. Are they proposing another lane? Well, I'm, they're going to have to do some, some stuff on there. So, to me – and there's no metro. There's no metro, which, you know, even though there's a metro station that's close to FedEx, it's still about a mile away. That's bad. There is no metro there. There's no, I guess you could say there's light rail that that they guess they could use, but that's still like four miles, five miles away. It's just not a good location. And here's where one of the state senators, because here's the thing I, I, I said, I believe they're using this for leverage to get a better deal elsewhere. Here's where it's kind of interesting, because originally Virginia was talking about a billion dollars of money to go towards the stadium. That plan changed and dropped down to about $350 million. Now, this is where it gets interesting. One of the state senators is pulling his support for this. I had a chance to read the legislation closely several times. It's original and amended form. That's where it went from a billion dollars to $350 million. I also followed the news as the team has obtained an option on land in Virginia to build a stadium and surrounding mixed-use development. I respect the fact that it might create jobs and revenue in Prince William. However, I do not plan to support the project or Virginia's pursuit of an NFL franchise. I have two concerns. One, that the development is too far removed from an urban setting, unlike Nats Park at the Navy Yard, which will make it solely dependent on vehicle traffic for access. More importantly, I don't have confidence in the Washington Commanders as a viable NFL franchise. Wow. He just said they're not a viable NFL franchise. Damn. That's some crazy shit there. He literally said, y'all are ass. You're not worth it. I'm not, I can't support you. And I got to tell you, I mean, for me, hell no. I don't want uh, 50 cents of my money to go towards the Washington Commanders. 
and certainly look at that and say, that would be a pooch screw, that location. And there's no way, no how that I believe that that spot is the spot that they honestly want to build it. There are better locations in Virginia, specifically out by Dulles Airport or even Sterling, or actually rebuilding at FedEx Field. Ultimately, you know, the best place would actually be in D.C. at the site of where RFK was because they already have a metro station there and it's like right there on 295. But hey, what do I know? I'm a guy with a day job and a voodoo doll who's talking about what else? The Dallas Cowboys. Hope you guys are having a great day. I got some more stuff to take care of, but we'll see you soon. And as always, I appreciate you. (laughs) 